What's up guys, Rick from DFS On Demand here with your DFS preview for this week's American Express. There are a lot of intricacies and just weird things with a unique tournament on the PGA Tour for this week. And I have a little surprise for you at the end of the video. There's a teaser for you. If you'd like to win access to DFSOnDemand.com, that's my site, all the tools that you see and much more on there. Uh, there's two ways to do so. So as usual, make sure that you are watching on YouTube. And if you are, like, subscribe to the channel, leave me a comment, and let me know which guy over $10,000 you are most excited to roster for this week. If you're on the audio podcast and are able to leave a review, please do so. Make it five stars. Say something nice about the show and leave me your Twitter, Twitter handle so I can get in touch with you. That'll put you in a draw to win access to DFSOnDemand.com. All right, I guess that's it. Let's get into the American Express. All right, the American Express, which has to be the worst name for a PGA event ever. Uh, we have to talk about the setup for this week because it is a pro-am and there is a three-course rotation. So this is just like the Pebble Beach pro-am and just like we've seen previous years here at this event, Desert Classic, Career Builder, Humana Challenge, all the same name, right? Or all different names, but same tournament. Three-course rotation. They're going to play the Stadium Course, La Quinta, and the Nicholas Tournament Course. In a specific order. So wherever you start, obviously that is going to impact where you go next. Now, <clears throat> obviously... Not all of these courses are going to play the same. In fact, La Quinta and the Nicholas Tournament course are the two easiest courses on the PGA Tour rotation last year out of 49 courses. They played like three and a half and two and a half shots under par, which is an insane number. The stadium course, which is the host course, actually uh, was the 10th easiest course. It played like 1.7 shots under par. So keep that in mind. The way it's going to happen is you're, everyone is going to play 54 holes meaning that uh, it's it's like a, it's not a no-cut event, obviously, but you're going to get three rounds out of everybody. And then there is going to be a cut after 54, and everyone will go back to the host course, the stadium course, and finish there. The stadium course is the only one with shot link data, and there's not many cameras on the other course, so it'll be more difficult to follow. Um, and these rounds are probably going to take like six and a half hours long because they are pro-am rounds. So I think that's everything let's jump into some of this the data from the last couple years here because this is um one of the questions i get like i know i'm gonna get all the time is about the course rotation stuff and i actually surprised myself here because i've been <laughs> i've been collecting it the last two years and uh it was very easy easy for me to bring up here so i just went through and looked at the average finish for each one of these courses, how many top 10s, how many top 25s, how many guys made the cut came out of each of the starting courses. Now, there are a lot of caveats with this information and there are flaws with this information. The caveat is if you miss the cut, uh, I gave you a 100, which is the way the golf industry deals with missed cuts. So you can do an average finish. Also, you have to understand that the order, I believe, is um, the order that you play them in is La Quinta, Nicholas Tournament, Stadium Course, then start over again. So if you start on the Nicholas Course, you will play Nicholas Thursday, Stadium Course, Friday, La Quinta, Saturday. Um, La Quinta is by far, if you start there, you have had the best finishes. Uh, average finishes. So last year, the average finish for La Quinta uh, starting there on Thursday was a 66. The Nicholas tournament course was very close behind 66.9 and the stadium course much worse, 72. Back to 2018, again, a lot better for La Quinta. La Quinta, excuse me, 62 was your average finish with the Nicholas course and the stadium course being much higher, both a hair over 70. There is a lot to talk about through that course rotation. Um, first of all, a lot of the better golfers tend to start at La Quinta because they the, the telecast wants the better golfers to be at the stadium course on Saturday, which is when they can show it. So they go Saturday for the um, 
you know, the third round and then Sunday again, where all the, where all the cameras are, uh, for the final round. So this can be a little bit skewed because in theory, not all of them, but sometimes the better players are starting at La Quinta, but it has been the most fruitful of places to start. We could spend another 45 minutes on the philosophy behind this, but I know I'm going to get asked this a thousand times. It's different for every player. You could, some of these guys will prefer to get a really good start and start at La Quinta and try to get out hot out of the gates. Some guys will like to save that for Saturday. You know, it's, it's one of these situations where, Hey, I have to play the two hardest courses. Then I know I'm going to get the super easy one on on Saturday. I still have it in my back pocket. I'm all good. It's personal preference. I personally believe this is my opinion. If you play, if you were able to play the stadium course, both Saturday and Sunday, I believe that would be an advantage come Sunday because you have just seen that course yesterday. You've seen it in the closest possible conditions and you haven't played two other courses since the last time you played it. So in theory, I think I would want to play La Quinta Nicholas stadium course that has revealed the most fruitful of results. Um, but you can kind of take away whether those are the best golfers or whether there is actually something to it. But this is the data that I have here for you. All right, let's switch over to the cheat sheet. So we have uh, Ricky Fowler leading the way here, 11,500, followed by Sung Jay at 11,000. Paul Casey, Tony Finau, Benny Ahn, and Charles Howell the third round out the $10,000 or more golfer. If you're picking one of these golfers, over $10,000, you kind of need them to win the golf tournament, which is really difficult to then go roster Ricky Fowler at 11,500, who we just haven't seen a whole lot of over the past couple months. You know, we know he got married. We know that he had, um, he had like an infection where he got sick for a bit, but we just haven't seen a lot of golf. Uh, T5 at the Century Tournament of Champions, which is great. But then he had a, a ninth at the Hero, which, you know, that's like half of the field. There's only 18 guys in that field. 19th at the tour championship, but there's only 30 guys in that field. What I think is interesting about Ricky is this event. He's basically fulfilling his obligation of, you know, the PGA tour. You have to play, I believe it's every event once every four years. It's a way to get these guys to go experience new places. Fan, um, you know, local fans can see these guys because Ricky's never played this event before. And he's also rarely played the pro, the AT&T Pebble Beach Pro-Am. He hasn't played that since 2012. He might just hate Pro-Ams. Like, th that's a real thing when you have to deal with amateurs and six and a half hour rounds. Might not be for everyone. I won't say that is the case for Ricky, but he just hasn't played a lot of these. So maybe it is. Um, 11500 is a lot of money for a guy who has not historically won a lot of golf tournaments. Um, but Sungjae at eleven. I, I can heap as much praise on Sung Jay as possible. Um, he is, you know, one of my favorite golfers. I think he is so super solid. If you, you know, if we pull up his, um, where is he? If we pull up his strokes gain database here, I mean, just tee to green numbers, you know, continues to gain. He's gained in six of his last eight tournaments. Um, he does it from everywhere, right? I mean, he's, he's very poor around the greens, but as we always say, when, you know, I hop on with Mayo, or we say it here a lot, it's like the winning score is going to be 25 under par. If you are trying to get up and down uh, for par, you are in big trouble. You like you having to use your around the green game this week is not going to help because you need to be making a lot of birdies uh, and eagles or better everything. You need to be going really, really low. So Sung Jay, uh, who makes a lot of birdies, uh, is is pretty intriguing here. So especially with how solid the rest of his game is. Now for eleven thousand dollars, we've never seen a price tag on Sung Jay that high. But I I believe once he wins, once he actually goes out and catches a W, um, like that's gonna be a really good situation where like like he's always going to be over ten k, right? Like he's just I, he's that good. He he really is. He's the reigning. PGA Tour Rookie of the Year. The kid's an absolute stud. Um, and then Benny on is probably the other guy over 10,000 that I think catches my eye a little bit because I, I think he has the upside, right? Like, what am I going to pay 10,100 for, for Charles Howe the third to finish 20th? He's like a lock to finish in the top 20, but like very rarely is he going to win a golf tournament. Charles Howe the third has one of the fewest 
uh, one of the lowest conversion rates on wins. I think he has two wins in 565 starts or something absolutely crazy. So probably could not invest in Charles Howell III. But Benny Ahn, who has not captured that first PGA Tour victory yet, has one on the Euro Tour, has one on the Korean Tour, and he is just the absolute fit of my type of guys who uh, gain tee to green and can't putt, quite frankly. So we can pull up his strokes gain database here. And while we do that, um, you know, his recent results have been really good too. So here's his, here's his uh, strokes gained database. And you can see, you know, outside of uh, his last two measured tournaments, which were the Shriners and the Safeway, which he actually lost strokes tee to green. That is very, very rare. You know, he rattled off, what is this? Three, six, like 10 in a row, 10 starts in a row before that, um, you know, like 23 of his last 27, he's gained strokes tee to green. I mean, just a, a very consistent ball striker. And when that, you know, the week that the, the putts start falling in for him is the week that he is going to start winning golf tournaments. And, um, you can see his recent form coming in six at the CJ cup, eighth at the Zozo and 14th at the WGC. So his numbers would actually probably be much better than what I showed you on the strokes game database, because he would have like three really good measured events. For example, the nine K range, very interesting here. Um, you know, Kisner, uh, that's probably fool's gold. Kind of like we talked about Patrick Reed. I really love Kevin Kisner long-term, not sure how much these three courses fit him, but, um, Scotty Scheffler, $9,500. I've already fired a bet on him. Uh, this to me, he will probably be a, a staple in a lot of my lineups. He could absolutely make my core. You can see this third place at Bermuda. Um, 18th at Mayakoba, fifth at the RSM, and this kid is going to win, and he's going to win a lot. Let me pull up his uh, his data here. So we have a small sample size on uh, on Scotty Scheffler, 13 measured tournaments, gained tee to green in 11 of them, has gained off the tee in, what is that, 10, uh, 11 straight or 12 straight, and um, plays well around the green, putts okay, it's the irons that when they catch fire, um, when they get hot, which he has proven he can, you know, eight strokes gained at the um, at the military tribute at Greenbrier, like he can gain four ish, four, five, six in a single week. Like those are the weeks he's going to really, really be in contention. I wish I had the Bermuda numbers here, but that's also a non shot link uh, data course. So there's actually, you know, a lot of, I think, I think these stats could actually be better for Scotty Scheffler. Oh, and I wanted to show you this really quick on Scheffler. Um, I had a note here that I wanted to, didn't want to lose here. So let's pull up Scotty. And of course it's a smaller sample size, but I like to look at this, uh, percentage of rounds that Scotty Scheffler is gaining T to green. That's my, that's my metric, baby. I love the T to green numbers. 70, nearly 76% of his rounds, 75.6% of his rounds, he gained strokes T to green. To put that into perspective, that is more than Ricky Fowler, who does it 69% of the time, and it is more than Tony Finau, who do it, who does it 72% of the time. So, like, he very much is amongst, uh, you know, the top end of this player pool, uh, that I think like it's it's just really impressive stuff, quite frankly. So I will continue to bet Scotty Scheffler and I will be early on him rather than late. The eight thousand dollar range. There are a couple of things here. Um, Phil Mickelson, I tweeted this out earlier because I when I was doing research for this, I wanted to at least bring this up. And let me pull up Phil Phil's round by round strokes gain because I know what the argument is already going to be. Um, Phil does have good tournament history, which I would actually argue tournament history this week is so difficult to try to bank on. First of all, no one has good tournament history, which makes sense because there's so much volatility, so much randomness when you have to play three courses, when there's a 54 hole cut, like there's just a lot going on. I mean, Adam, Adam Long comes out and wins this thing last year out of nowhere. The whole field gets opened up. Um, you know, if you get a windy day on a hard course or a windy day on an easy course, there's just so many factors that go into this, but Phil does actually have good tournament history. Second last year, third in 2016. But here's my problem with Phil. And I tweeted this out. 
From the time Phil won, which was this event right here, AT&T Pebble Beach. So it was the, you know, second week of February. So if we look at his strokes gained here and we just do like, I want to go, I want to go before his win and after his win. So before his win, like, like people think that the downfall of Phil Mickelson is, is tied to his, his off the tee game because you hear so much about hitting bombs and all that, like. Phil has sprayed it for a long time. Phil has historically been a really good putter. And, and you know, the short game wizard that we that we hear so much about. And it's true, quite frankly. So before his win, so 159 rounds before his win, Phil was gaining strokes putting 64% of the time. After that win, so let's go after that tournament. So like the, the 11th to... Um, current so 211 2019 to current in his last 44 rounds it's basically completely flopped he's only gaining strokes in 40 percent of those rounds on the greens so he's gone he went from 65 percent on the plus side to 60 percent on the negative side that is really bad throw in the fact that yeah his driver also stinks like i like a lot would have to come together for Phil to get any type of my attention for this week. And quite frankly, moving forward, because I don't necessarily love his prospects moving forward. The rest of that AK range doesn't really do much for me. I guess um, I'd be vaguely interested in Brian Harmon. I'd be vaguely interested in maybe like a Chez Reavy or a Russell Knox. Not super thrilled about it. But 7,900, I do think Vaughn Taylor... Uh, he at least moved the, moves the needle for me. So he comes in in really great form, right? Second at Mayakoba, 10th at the RSM, 12th at the Sony Open. Three top 12 finishes. He finished 7th here last year. And if we pull up his uh, his strokes gain stuff, and I'm sticking with this strokes gain database. You know, I have the um, I have the course key stats, which I can sh I can talk about in a second. I'll show you right now. Like I have the course key stats for this week, but keep in mind, like, you know, we only have shot linked in on one of these on one of these courses. The fact that you know you're trying to compute what what is happening across three separate courses, like it's going to be so hard to do. So I, I'm kind of ignoring a lot of the the regression course key stats, which I think is an important part of any of this is knowing your limitations. You know, this, this is a tool that I live and die by. I love this. This is a calculation I created that I absolutely love, but not this week. I understand the limitations of it. Three course rotation. No, thank you. I'll go somewhere else. So back to Von Taylor, uh, he's $7,900. He's 50 to one. Look at his, look, let's look at his recent tournaments here. And what you'll see is he has gained on approach in six of his last eight tournaments he's gained in putting in 19 of his last 22 that's like world level stuff considering putting is the most volatile of any of these four main strokes gained categories uh really solid i mean look at this just as just as strokes gained total he's gained in what is that eight nine ten like ten of his last 12 tournaments and the other little nugget that I liked, <clears throat> I'm certainly not trying to compare this event to Pebble Beach uh, and the AT&T Pro-Am. Absolutely not. But I do think there is something to go along with very long rounds, dealing with amateurs, and dealing with a three-course rotation. It takes a special type of golfer to do that. Von Taylor has won the, Pro the Pebble Beach Pro-Am before. So good results there, good results here, playing well. Sure, Von Taylor, 7,900 bucks, makes a lot of sense for me, and that's probably a sentence that I have never said before. And then in terms of value, there's a couple of guys down here. Um, okay, actually, before we get too far down, Brendan Steele at $7,500, coming off of whatever you want to call it last week, the choke job. Um, yeah, he, he punted it. I mean, he, when you start around with a three shot, when you go into Sunday with a three shot lead, you should win. No, no doubt about it. Uh, I'm going to say this guy was the best player on the planet for the last 70 for 71 holes last week. Um, 
I'm going to cut him a pass. You know what I mean? Like, I think this is a pretty interesting spot where no one's going to be on him. He played really well last week. And this has been a tournament that he's found a lot of success at in the past. So, like, the narrative, like, if Cam Smith just outright beats him, like, this isn't ever, ever everyone's playing Brandon Steele this week because his tournament history, second in 2015, sixth in 2017, he's made five straight cuts here. Like, this feels kind of good. This is the time of year to use Brendan Steele. Played really well last week, but I think he goes super overlooked. Who else? Um, Henrik Norlander was interesting. The fifth and the ninth at the RSM and the Sony. Um, what I like about Norlander is pretty good with the irons. Pretty good approach player. Okay, he can he can stripe it. He can get things going. He has also made two cuts. Uh, his last two cuts at AT and T Pebble Beach. Uh, not a young guy. He's, he's, he has a lot of experience, but this is like his first full-time tour season. Um, but played, played really well last week. Taylor Gooch, another guy who, you know, I love the approach players, right? I love the approach players. He had a fourth place finish last year, fourth in Houston, uh, has made, you know, what five or six cuts in a row playing well enough. I'm trying to see if there's any other names down here. You start to get pretty, pretty pretty bad when you get under 7,000, which might lead to a lot of, uh, more balanced builds. I wonder if a lot of people will go back to Bill Haas here. I'm not a, I'm not a big Bill Haas fan at all. He's 6,700. He won it in 2015, but I'm, I'm kind of off of that. Um, I Hudson Swafford is another past champion who's down here, but again, probably not moving the needle too much for me. When I get down here, I'm looking for more of, of recent form. And uh, I'm not really finding it. I mean, Robbie Shelton, no, like that's that's pretty bad too. So it, this might, you know, obviously early in the week have not started building a lot of lineups yet, but uh, they might end up being more balanced builds than anything. But we'll see. We'll see. Try to get those guys in the $7,000 range and see what happens. Now, I have something else to show you. Um, and it, this is very much in its beta introduction phase. But as you know, I've been talking about bringing European tour data onto my site, dfsondemand.com. And I've started to do that. So there is a cheat sheet for this week that will start to fill itself out. So the, the European tour is in Abu Dhabi this week. We have a lot of names that we recognize. It is headlined by Tommy Fleetwood at 11,400. Patrick Cantlay is in this field. Brooks Kepka, Louis Oosthuizen. I mean, Brandon Grace, who just won last week. So this cheat sheet available for all the members. No, it's the same exact price. Nothing has changed. You can go to under Euro up here at the top or get there from the homepage. So this cheat sheet will start to fill out like the PGA cheat sheet, right? So we have the strokes gain data. If someone doesn't have strokes gain data, it means they don't have enough rounds to qualify yet. As the season gets going, this will all start to fill in. So bear with me on that for now. I've got projections in here. I've got recent history, just like we do on the PGA Tour. So you can see Louis came in second at the South African Open. Brandon Grace won it. Brandon Grace has now got a first and a third in his previous two starts. Trust me, I, I, I do not claim to be a European Tour expert. But I'm trying to build the tools. I'm trying to build the data to give you information. I'm going to start playing a lot more Euro Tour contests because I think it's a really good spot to grow the game. And uh, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. You know, as you scroll through this, you can find a lot of guys opposite of the American Express who have a lot of really good tournament history here. Thomas Peters has four top 16 finishes in his last five years. Bern Wiesberger. Kind of a similar thing. Three top 15s, you know, never misses a cut. There are guys, even as you get down into value as I was going through this, you know, Pablo Pablo Larazabal, Lera, Lera excuse me, I'm going to have to get my pronunciation better, coming off a win in his last start, has two top sixes in his last three starts here in Abu Dhabi. So there are some guys, I mean, continue to look down this, Ross Fisher. Like, you can build some, some lineups based on course history, um, and get some really good value. So I encourage you to check this tool out in addition to um, the European Tour golfer profile. So you can go through and see recent results. You know, you can drop this down and find, you know, any golfer that you want here. Like we could go get Louis, I suppose. 
Okay, so this is very similar to the PGA Tour, but it's going to show you their European Tour information. And then there are European Tour game logs in the same way that there are PGA Tour game log. So this is an opportunity for me to continue to build out my golf offerings uh, now that this is a full-time focus. So um, keep that. So I'll be collecting a lot more European data. These will evolve over time. This is really just phase one. If you see any issues, let me know, first of all, uh, and I'll fix them. But this is a really good step forward that I'm proud of, and I'll continue to bring you more stuff like this. All right, that's it. Rick Run Good on Twitter. Hit me up. Let me know what you think. Talk to you guys soon. Good luck.